Hello and welcome to our weekly look inside Syria. I'm Hazm Seeker. Well, it's been a week of major developments in the Syrian conflict on the ground and on the diplomatic front. On Tuesday, Syria's main opposition group took a symbolic step forward. The leaders of the national coalition formally took Syria's seat at the Arab League summit in Doha. Ahmad Mouaz al-Khatib represented the Syrian National Coalition despite his threat to resign. Members of the Arab League have also been authorized to send weapons to fighters in Syria if they choose to. Meanwhile, Mouaz al-Khatib has asked the United States to protect rebel-held north using Patriot missiles. We thank all the governments who supported us, but the role to be played by the United States is much bigger. I requested Mr. Kerry to provide Patriot missiles to protect the northern provinces. We have requested NATO to spare the lives of innocent civilians. We do not wish to fight. We want to protect civilians, to restore the normal way of life. Well, this week we focus on the internal divisions inside the Syrian National Coalition. Last week it seemed on the verge of collapse after its president, Ahmad Mouaz al-Khatib, offered his resignation only days before representing the coalition in the Arab League summit in Doha. Meanwhile, several opposition members have been calling for restructuring the Syrian National Coalition and completely abandoning the provisional government, along with establishing clear relationships with opposition parties and the Free Syrian Army Army and working on transforming it into a national army with a high degree of discipline and combat readiness. Well, joining us now to talk more about this and to understand the divisions inside the Syrian opposition, we're joined by our three guests in Washington, D.C., Najib Radban, representative of the National Coalition of Revolution and Opposition Forces at the U.N., in Edinburgh, we have Robin Yassin Kassab, a novelist and commentator. And in Athens, Ohio, Amr al-Azm, a professor of Middle East history and anthropology at Shawnee State University. Good to have you all uh, with us, uh, gentlemen. Najib Ghadban, if I could start with you. Now, this recognition uh, by the Arab League um, uh, of your group appears to be an important diplomatic gain for the Syrian opposition. But what does it really do uh, to advance the cause? Um, well, it's extremely important, not only symbolically, uh, but politically, diplomatically, uh, in terms of uh, further isolating the regime, delegitimizing the regime, uh, telling, sending a message that this is no longer um, an acceptable, um, responsible regime. Uh, and I think some of the political implications are um, up to the countries to now extend further recognition uh, to the SC, Syrian coalition, as the sole and legitimate representative, and uh, as such, um, they could in fact hand over the Syrian embassies to the coalition. Robin Yassin Kassab, what are the implications of this beyond just the symbolic? It's not clear. I mean, at the moment, it really is diplomatic and symbolic. It is important because it shows that the Arab League has, and we hope that most of the international community has recognized that this regime, after two years of slaughtering its own people and destroying its own country, is not um, a, a legitimate representative of, of, of Syria. However, because we're about to talk about this, I think, because the coalition is divided because um, the political opposition, especially the external political opposition, is struggling for relevance on the ground in Syria. It's not quite clear yet um, quite what it means. What's going to have to happen at some point is that the, we hope is going to happen at some point, is that the external opposition, the political elite, is going to have to be working hand in glove with the committees and the militias on the ground so that um, new forms of governance can be, can be built in the absence of the regime. Is that what it comes down to for you then, uh, Amr al-Azm? I mean, uh, winning Syria's seat in the Arab League was uh, important in a lot of ways, but uh, it means nothing unless the coalition can demonstrate uh, the ability to, to, to govern in the rebel-held areas. Well, I mean, just going back to the original uh, statement that it is something symbolic. I mean, yes, that's what it is. It's symbolic. But I don't think it's going to have that much of an impact on the ground in terms of 
changing what's happening there, or in fact even influencing decisions that have already been made on the international level uh, by the international community in terms of who to provide aid to or what type of aid and so on and so forth. I think these decisions were being had already been made and are being carried out irrespective of whether the opposition actually formed this government or not, which begs into the question really of what is the purpose of this government other than to uh, basically bring forth, if you wish, some of the internal divisions that have been seething underneath, very, very close underneath the surface. And uh, furthermore, um, in terms of its viability, I mean, uh, such a government, I mean, this is the last card that the, the Syrian opposition has politically. And to play it now and so early seems a little, uh, in my opinion, rash, just, just to uh, uh, you know, continue in, in the same vein and with the same problems that we have seen right along from the very beginning in terms of how the, the internal dynamics of the opposition have been sort of ex demonstrating themselves. Let's talk more about some of these uh, internal divisions then. Uh, Najib uh, Ghadban, differences within the coalition uh, over the wisdom of forming a provisional government uh, to, to administer these opposition-held areas in Syria. Now, uh, Ahmed Mouaz al-Khatib um, believes that, uh, I mean, he's opposed this move because he fears it's going to uh, lead to a partition of the country. Does he have a point there? Uh, let me correct a couple of points that already mentioned and, and address this point. Uh, first of all, uh, the question of the government was built into the idea of the coalition. When the coalition was created, it was one of the ways to create a process through which we were able to create an interim government, which is what's called. It's not provisional, it's not transitional. Uh, second, uh, this question of the division within the coalition uh, is natural. This is a coalition. This is uh, made up of uh, several groups, individuals, uh, different geographical, uh, political backgrounds. Uh, but I think that the main issue of the government is to uh, be able to govern the liberated areas. It's uh, targeted toward the inside. Um, and let's not forget that's already 60, 70 percent beyond the control of the regime. And it cries for some form of control, of governance, which has been now done by the local council. So this central interim government is going to coordinate these areas of relief, of security and services to those areas. So that's the, the, the last point about your question about Mr. Al-Khatib. Actually, Mr. Al-Khatib, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, divide in, within the coalition was whether to call this an interim government or executive authority. It was over the semantic, not the, the, the necessity of creating an executive authority uh, that's so required. So despite that, he actually went along with the majority view and uh, oversaw the process of selecting a designated interim prime minister. All right, but I, let me let me ask you this: and why did why did he decide initially to resign? Then, what was the the story behind that? If if this um, uh, if this group is is if these divisions, as you say, are are, are not really a big deal. I think he gave uh, clear justification, at least in two occasions. One of them was on the Arabic Al Jazeera, in which he said he was so frustrated with the international community and its ability to, in fact, help the Syrian people. He was very specific about that. He said it, it had nothing to do, in fact, with the choice of the uh, prime minister. It had to do, again, with promises coming from our friends and, and not being able to you know, fulfill these promises. He, in fact, mentioned in particular his frustration with the meeting of the EU in uh, in, in Dublin, uh, in which, again, uh, there were so many uh, efforts and promises to lift the arms embargo on the FSA, and then they couldn't do it. Uh, so that was the main reason, as I heard him saying that in at least two occasions. Robin Yassin uh, Kassab, it's becoming apparent as well that some of these uh, uh, so-called uh, Islamist rebel groups uh, that have made considerable gains, not just on the battlefield, uh, as we've said many times, but also more increasingly proactive, it seems, in providing local governance uh, in the areas that are under their control. Isn't that something that the uh, Syrian National Coalition is, is going to have to contend with? Absolutely. This is why um, I ag agree completely that uh, government is essential. The, one of the many dangers facing Syria now is splintering and warlordism. In fact, it seems that the regime wants this solution. If, if the regime can't rule the whole of the country, it would prefer to have a warlord 
um, system whereby Bashar al-Assad will survive as a warlord amongst many other warlords, some of them Salafi extremists and, and so on. So it's essential that there is some kind of central authority. As our colleague said there, the, maybe 60 to 70 percent of the country has already been liberated, but it's not liberated from the from the air. So um, people need to be able to get in there and, 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 and establish government so that we don't have warlordism and we don't have extremist groups setting their agenda and setting up legal, different legal systems in different parts of the country. But I think the division in the coalition has been, you know, it, it's, it's, it's bigger than what's been described. I think it's not just, it's certainly Mu'az al-Khatib did resign in part because out of disgust that the, the West is still not really helping with, with um, the Syrians to arm themselves, to defend themselves from the, the regime. But also it seems that some of the um, behind-the-scenes arm-twisting or battling over the election of Ghassan Hitto to um, Prime Minister um, in the interim government, and Qatar and Saudi Arabia probably um, and their supporters fighting to get their candidate. Now it seems that Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood got their candidate and that wasn't unanimous that didn't please everybody in the coalition it certainly didn't please the the liberals the muslim brotherhood of course is a political party whose way of thinking is shared by many people in syria so they do have a very important role to play but um, i question the wisdom of them trying to first in the syrian national council now in the coalition of really trying to as an organization trying to to dominate that seems to be um, a negative thing which isn't helping unity. I think what Mazel Khatib wanted to do was to bring more people from the ground, more representatives of the local coordination committees, more representatives of the free Syrian army militias who are fighting on the ground to have a say in the makeup of the interim government. Hamar al Azm, is the, the internal divisions that we're seeing at the moment among the Syrian opposition, is some of that being fueled uh, by the support that they're getting from countries? Uh, like uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Turkey and the fact that they are they are in different camps in all of this as well. Well there's no doubt that uh, the involvement of regional actors and uh, their um, let's say um, uh, competition over who gets to have more control over what's happening in Syria is, is playing out within internal opposition politics as well. I mean I uh, concur uh, quite you know completely with with the uh, Robin's uh, assessment in that uh, basically there was a lot of uh, you know that on the face of it obviously it seems everybody's pleased with Hassan Ito and so on so forth but really behind the scenes there was a lot of arm twisting there was a lot of maneuvering and in fact for many of us we we know that it, this was cooked between uh, you know the 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 cuttery let's say wing of, of the SOC led by Mustafa Sabah on the one side and his uh, uh, clique and and the, and the Muslim Brotherhood, at, I would say a temporary alliance because these two groups don't really like each other, and the Muslim uh, Brotherhood being represented here by the SNC, uh, in which they outmaneuvered the uh, more liberal wings of. Uh, uh, of the SOC and the independents along with Mu'az al-Khatib and that was all along the plan. The plan is, was that they would basically, uh, in order to bypass uh, Mu'az al-Khatib, in order to uh, pull, let's say, decision making back in that direction, um, th th this whole thing was engineered. And that's part of the problem really, because the problem seems to lie in the process rather than the end product. And many of the efforts of the Syrian opposition have focused on the end product and ignored the process. And invariably, when there is a problem with the process, when the process is, is, is somehow delegitimized or, or, or there is an issue with it, then the end product is more likely to fail. And that is our concern with this current government that has been set up. The process was flawed, as always, because of the very same people that have been involved in every single process uh, within the opposition, and, 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 and they have consistently failed. All I have to do is point back to the SNC, to, to the uh, follow-up committee, and, and then also to the formation of the SOC. And in this action, they almost brought the SOC to disintegration. This forcing, this this hurried forcing of the creation of, of a government with the with All a, right. uh, as you said, uh, as, as, as Robin said, a, a Muslim Brotherhood, and and. Uh, 
let's and, and Qatari candidate in place. Now the trick is to see whether they can conf transform that into something a little more effective. And, 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 and I don't see that. They have no plan. They have no well, strategy let's put that, yet. Let's put they that chose the man back to, before uh, they had the strategy. Let's put that to point me, that's back like to Najib, the is, the, the horse. is the problem here uh, uh, the, the process rather than uh, focusing on the end game? Let me, again, before I address the question of the process and the end game, say that some of the points mentioned by my two colleagues uh, are definitely not accurate. Uh, the, to talk about the meddling of external actors is, is definitely true, uh, but it's definitely exaggerated. Uh, let me say that there is no such thing as a Qatari candidate. Uh, I'm open here and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking openly. Uh, the candidate uh, that uh, many of us, in fact, uh, wanted to have was Mr. Riyadh Hijab, who came from within the regime. And we felt that would send a message about the continuity of the state institution. Uh, it would send a message uh, to the uh, Ba'athists and, and, and was acceptable by regional, uh, you know, kind of friends. Uh, and so uh, after Mr. Riyadh Hijab decided not to be in the run, I think the, the name of, uh, of Mr. Hito came up. And, and it came because he actually proved himself as the head of the ACU. Uh, he's a technocrat, and, and the whole vision, again, is to create a technocratic government uh, oriented toward the inside. That's, that's the point. Uh, the, secondly, I mean, the, the whole issue, again, of, uh, you know, that uh, Mr. Al-Adam mentioned about rushing into the government. As I said, no, actually, that coalition was created uh, to create a process that would, uh, again, um, you know, part of its outcome is an executive authority or a government, interim, interim government. So there's no rushing here. And by the way, now, Mr. Uh, uh, yani Hito, he is a designated interim prime minister. He will be giving a chance to uh, recruit his team to present a detailed program before the coalition, and then uh, when he gets the confidence, he is actually to be uh, named, a, you know, an, an interim prime minister, and he may succeed, he may not. The second point, uh, the coalition is very aware of its shortcomings, and I think you will see very soon that it will be, in fact, restructured. I think the, the, the voices we heard uh, over the last week or so uh, are echoed, you know, in voices within the coalition. More than half of those who, in fact, signed the petition to reform the coalition are members of the coalition themselves. I'm one of those who wa was never happy with women's representation in the coalition. So right. uh, this whole thing, uh, again, there is a process. It's a work in progress. It can be improved, and I think that's what okay. we're trying to do. I, I want to move on then to, to something else that happened this week. Well, Syrian Alawites from all over the world gathered in Cairo this week to join forces with the Syrian opposition movement and to accuse the Syrian regime of crimes against humanity. Alawites are the minority sect, of course, that Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and his family belong to. At the meeting, they produced a declaration. Its key points, a call for Alawites to support the revolution, not to join the Syrian army or take up arms against fellow Syrians, a public trial of the Syrian regime's leaders, and recognize that the Syrian regime is not Alawite, and finally, a demand that Alawites inside Syria recognize they are being used by the regime. If I could turn back to you on this, uh, Najib, uh, obviously uh, uh, Alawites in, 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 in inside and outside of Syria don't want this to descend into a, a sectarian uh, conflict. What sort of uh, assurances can you give groups like them and other minority groups in Syria that that's not going to happen? Well, I mean, from the you know first, first day of the revolution, uh, the one of the messages uh, of the revolution and it's still one of the bases of the revolution uh, this is again uh, a uh, you know a revolution for all Syrians uh, we are you know kind of trying striving to create a state based on equal citizenship uh, a state that is pluralistic civic democratic um, and uh, the uh, all of the documents that were in fact uh, produced by the opposition whether as groups or collectively with an SNC and a Syrian coalition uh, you know, assure the, the Alawite they are a, an important component and, and other minorities uh, of uh, the future of Syria. I think our quarrel is with those who committed crimes against humanity. Mo ma there are many of them that's uh, Alawite in the current regime, but there are others. And most Alawites, in fact, have been, like everybody else, uh, subjected to discrimination and, and marginalization by the regime. So I think the, the Cairo conference was a, a, an excellent opportunity 
to highlight the voices of the Alawite within the revolution, those who have been, right. in fact, from day one, part of this struggle to send that message you Okay, I, I want to move on now and talk about uh, the situation on, on the ground. Opposition fighters in Syria appeared to be gaining new ground on Friday, seizing control of the southern town of Da'il. The town near the border with Jordan is less than 100 kilometers from the capital. Until now, the rebel offensive has centered around the northern cities of Aleppo, Raqqa and Deir ez-Zor. Dominic Cain reports. This is Da'el, once a center of peaceful opposition to President Bashar Assad. But now, a key staging post on the front line. For days, the rebels have been attacking government forces here, using machine guns to take on Assad's heavily armed troops. These rebels improvised their own armored car to take on the tanks. But the main focus has been on house-to-house -house fighting. The rebels' claim to have taken control of the town from Assad's soldiers has been met with approval by some of the people here. And one analyst says losing Da'el is a serious setback for President Assad. By being able to interdict the road between Damascus and Amman, Jordan, by uh, having a swath of territory uh, that they controlled near the border. They're going to be able to get their weapons uh, from Jordan, uh, send fighters into Jordan for training and the like. So it, it's, it's troubling for the regime, no doubt about it. Over the course of the two-year conflict, the rebels have had more success taking towns and cities in northern Syria. But the government response has been violent and sometimes indiscriminate. This internet video appears to show the aftermath of a rocket strike. The speaker says it's the town of Khaitan, northwest of Aleppo city. He says the destruction here was caused by a Scud missile. This man cradles the body of a baby killed in the attack. Sites like these have become commonplace in Syria, where the government has used mortars and rockets to bombard rebel-held areas, like Babila in the suburbs of Damascus. Once a prosperous place, but now, like much of the rest of the country, a wasteland in Syria's civil war. Dominic Kane, Al Jazeera. Amin al we've talked a lot about all of the various political and diplomatic goings on here, but isn't it the case that it is uh, the men with the guns who will ultimately uh, call the shots uh, in all of this conflict uh, as it unfolds? Ultimately, this is where it really all counts. It's, it's what's happening on the ground. It's the militant forces on the ground that are really calling the shots. And, uh, you know, in terms of how the international community is responding to this, we can see that clearly where um, we have a, a clear shift in terms of uh, international community support for and, and a recognition that the south and the area in, in, in uh, the, the province of Dara and, and Damascus are now the key uh, since much of the north has fallen to various uh, armed opposition forces, some of which are, uh, you know, known FSA units with, uh, you know, uh, clear lines of communication with, with, with the uh, uh, with, the, with the central command, but there are then other units and other groups in, uh, who are uh, known Salafists or, or, or uh, you know, radical Islamist groups, and they are a serious problem. And, and, and how do you sort of then control the move from right. uh, the north by these groups uh, who are increasingly infiltrating and joining into the south? Robin, Robin Yassin Kassab, just briefly, is that how you see this playing out as well? Yeah, I think that the first thing is that this is not a stalemate. People say that neither side can win, but the, the Assad regime is losing. As soon as some more weapons come in, recently some have come into the south from um, Croatia, probably paid for by the Saudis, perhaps with the help of the Americans. That's a new thing. There is some aid coming in, anti-tank weaponry, and it's had a big effect. And yes, of course, sadly, this thing didn't work through democratic, peaceful process, and the men with the guns are setting the agenda. It's probably because the Salafist groups in the north and east have had so much success that belatedly the West and the Arabs are being a bit more serious about trying to help the more moderate All right, groups. I just want to give the last word then uh, to uh, Najib. How do you see this playing out then briefly uh, over the next few weeks? 
I think the trend is, is very positive on the ground. I think the FSA is making progress. Uh, but we could, in fact, and this is what we are appealing to our friends, is to help us finish the job efficiently, quickly, with the least cost. Uh, I think the way to do it is to supply the moderate forces within the FSA under General Salim Idris with weapons. Uh, it will be done. Uh, and I think this is an opportunity for those on the other side to switch side and to join the forces of the revolution to All be right. part of the future of Syria. And on that, we will have to leave it. I want to thank all three of our guests in Washington, D.C., Najib Ghadban in Edinburgh, Robin Yassin Kassab, and in Athens, Ohio, Amr al Azm. Thanks very much. And thank you for joining us. Remember, Al Jazeera has extensive coverage of what's going on in Syria, not just on this program, but our On the Hour news bulletins. And online, of course, at aljazeera.com. I'm Hazm Seeker. Thanks for joining us. The latest news is up next.